In this video, we're going to look at how we can derive some equations from the ideal gas law. And the first one we're going to look at is how we can get the molecular weight of a gas. So if you guys remember, uh, the molecular weight is equal to the mass divided by the number of moles. And so we can sort of summarize this as m divided by the number of moles, which is n. So if we reorganize this equation a little bit, we can say that n is equal to m over the molecular weight, or the mass of the gas divided by the molecular weight is equal to the number of moles. Now if I plug this in to PV equals nRT, what I can do is I can plug this entire thing in here into the n, and so what I get is PV is equal to m over the molecular weight times RT. And so if we reorganize a little bit, uh, what I can do is I can get the molecular weight all by itself by moving that to the, to the one side and then putting all the variables on the other. So when I do that, I get molecular weight is equal to MRT over PV. And so now we have a, an equation that allows us to compute the molecular weight of a gas um, from variables such as the mass the universal gas constant, the temperature, the pressure, and the volume. So just keep in mind that this little m is mass of the gas. And we're actually going to use this in one of our experiments. We calculate the molecular weight of a gas, um, and in this case we calculate the molecular weight of a alcohol, which we evaporate into the gas phase, and then we measure its pressure, volume, and temperature. And then when we condense it, we can get the mass of the liquid alcohol, and we can get its molecular weight. So that's the first derivation. And the second derivation is where we can determine the density. If we want to determine the density, we have to remember what density is. Density is equivalent to the mass of, a, of the gas divided by the volume of the gas. And it turns out that that's actually built into our equation. So we have the molecular weight is equal to mRT. And I'm just going to put over Vp. So if you see, there's actually m over V already inside of this equation. So if I kind of block that off, I can say, well, this is equal to the density. So now what I can say is, well, the molecular weight is equal to the density times RT over the pressure. And that's just because the density is equal to the mass over the volume. So what's interesting about this is that we, look, we discover now that the density of a gas is proportional to the molecular weight. And the reason why this is interesting is because now we can tell whether a gas will rise or sink in another gas depending on the density of those two gases. So for example, if we have two gases and one has a much larger molecular weight, that gas is going to tend to sink to the bottom and the other gas is going to tend to rise to the top. Just like something that's less dense than water will rise to the top and something that's more dense than water will, will sink to the bottom. So an interesting question that we can ask ourselves is, well, what is the density of air? Because generally speaking, we might want to know if a gas is going, to, uh, is going to either go rise or sink in air. So you have to remember that air is three parts. Air is 78% nitrogen. And these are approximate. There are some decimal places. About 21% uh, oxygen and about 1% argon. And again, uh, there, are, there are some gases in air, like carbon dioxide, that are also there. Uh, they are relatively small in comparison to the argon. So the argon is about 1%, so it's about 0.9 or something like that percent. And then the rest that's in there is the um, carbon dioxide, uh, neon, helium, all the noble gases and that kind of stuff besides argon. So now the question is, is can we calculate a density of air? And really, we don't even need to actually calculate the density. All we need to do is we need to calculate the molecular weight. Because if we know what the molecular weight is, then we can compare the density of another gas by looking at its molecular weight. So let's come up with the molecular weight of air. So to do that, what we're going to do is we have to come up with a combined or a composite molecular weight of all three of these components. So what we're going to do is if, if air is 78% nitrogen, we can, set, we can take 0.78 times the molecular weight of nitrogen, which is 28 grams per mole. 
right? So we're taking, if air is 78% is, uh, nitrogen, we can take 78, uh, 0.78 times its molecular weight and get the mass component that's from the nitrogen. We could do the same thing for oxygen. That's going to be 0 0.21 times the uh, molecular weight of air of oxygen, which is 32 grams per mole, plus argon, which is 0 0.01 times 39.95 grams per mole. And so the molecular weight of air we get is about 29 grams per mole. And this is important. That's something that you should have in the back of your mind because since molecular weight is proportional to density, what we can say is that if, the, if a gas has a molecular weight that's greater than air, then this is gas is going to sink. Because in essence, what this means is that the density of the gas is greater than the density of the air because the molecular weight and density are proportional. So if the molecular weight of a gas is less than the molecular weight of air, the gas will rise. And the density of the gas will be less than the density of air. This is actually really important in a chemistry, uh, in a chemistry lab, for example. So in a lot of chemistry labs, we use nitrogen and argon as gases to run experiments. And the reason why we use nitrogen and argon is because uh, nitrogen and argon are essentially non-reactive. When you run experiments in nitrogen and argon, the threat of having an oxygen deficient environment is kind of different. So nitrogen, since it's so similar to air, so the molecular weight of nitrogen is equal to about 28 grams per mole. And this is about the same as air. So when you have nitrogen being, let's just say that your tank leaked and you had a whole bunch of nitrogen released into the room. Well, that nitrogen is gonna kind of fill the room up evenly because it's about the same molecular weight as air. If anything, it's a slightly less than air, so it might rise a little bit, but it's pretty close. Now the molecular weight of argon, on the other hand, is equal to 0.95 grams per mole. And this is much greater than air. So if your argon tank were to leak, what would happen is, is the room would fill up with argon, but it would fill up from the, your, the floor up toward the ceiling as more and more argon was released. So you may have oxygen when you're standing, but if you were to sit down, you would have no oxygen because down there, it might be completely filled with argon. So this is something that's important. And, and actually with carbon monoxide gas, uh, a kind of similar thing happens. Um, so th that's something to think about with where you put your carbon monoxide detectors. Now, the only thing that I wanna point out is, is all of these things are have one condition, and that is that the pressure and the temperature are the same. So this just this this level of a, this level of analysis assumes that the pressure and the temperature are the same. If we want to look at the effect of temperature on density, we can reorganize the density equation to get density by itself. So what we could say is that density is equal to p molecular weight over r t. So in the case of temperature, we see that there's an indirect relationship. So as you increase temperature, you decrease density. And actually, this is how hot air balloons work. When you have a hot air balloon, you fill up a, a balloon with air. It's the same exact material, uh, same exact gas as what's outside the balloon. The only difference is, is you heat up that air. So when you heat up the air, the density decreases and the balloon rises. As the balloon slowly cools off, the density becomes the same as the density of the air around it, and then the balloon will slowly float back down to Earth. So we can look at the